So section 1.2 is, uh, so here we're, 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 we're given some formulas basically. And these formulas are typically motivated by some kind of, uh, you know, like um, word problem or something. And then we're asked to like solve for one of the, one of the variables in terms of the other, all right? So here, here the answer is not necessarily going to be a, um, you know, um, a number. It might actually just be some sort of expression. So here is example. So section 1.2, formulas and applications. So here's an example. In physics, we sometimes look at k is equal to 1 half mv squared, right? This is a formula that people in physics study. It's the kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is 1 half the mass times the velocity squared. So a problem we could ask is to solve for m. So how would we solve for m? So let's see here. We would multiply both sides by 2, right? So we have 2k equals to mv squared. Multiply by 2, right? Does that make sense? So. Yeah, multiply, multiply this equation by 2 on both sides, right? So 2k, the step I didn't write down, is 2 times 1 half mv squared, right? So multiply the equation by 2 on both sides. Um, and that gives us, of course, the 2 and the half cancel. We get mv squared, right? So to solve for m, what do I need to do? I just need to divide by the what? Divide, well, I mean, so let me write it this way. I'm, I'm going to put this over here. So we've got mv squared, right, equals to 2 times k, right? You can, right, you know, you can switch the order, right? I'm trying to solve for m, though. So, yeah, divide by v squared is what we want to do. See, if we divide this by v squared... And we divide this by v squared, what does that give us? That gives us the v squareds cancel on the left. And we get m is equal to 2k over v squared. There you go. All right. You can move up. You can move like, is that, you, you got, you're fine from there? See, my eyes. Like, I wouldn't be okay back there, but if you're good, it's all good. Uh, example two. Um, the um, potential energy, PE, is equal to MGH. This is another example from physics. Potential energy is mass times gravity times height, all right? And you could ask a question like, you know, if the potential energy is equal to, you know, 1,000 joules, well, I'm sorry, let me not do units. I'm going to not, I will forget a bit. No units. I'll leave that for your science class in here. Suppose the potential energy is equal to 1,000, right? What would H be? So here's the problem. We have PE is equal to MGH. We're given that the potential energy is 1,000, all right? And then the question is, what is H? So this kind of problem, you've got to put the number in to the formula and then do the algebra, right? So what we have, we've got to solve, we need to solve 1,000 equals to MGH for H. So what do, we, what do we need to do to isolate H? 
right? Divide both sides by mg is what we should do. All right, so 1,000 over mg is equal to mgh over mg. Of course, the mg's cancel, and we just get h, right? And I just I have a little bit of OCD, so I have to write my answer like this. It's not really more logical than what I have above, but here it is. And so unless they give you more information, that would be the answer, you know? Now, if I also knew that the mass was 10, you know, and I'm working in SI units, kilograms, meters, and seconds, then I know that G is 9.8 meters per second squared, you know, so I could actually calculate the H. But this makes a lot of sense, right? Um, the, um, the smaller the mass is, the higher you has to the higher, higher the H has to be to get a thousand potential energy. On the other hand, if your mass is really, really big, you don't have to hold it as high to get that much energy, right? It's like the potential energy of this chalk, you know, it's not that much, right? If I drop it, oh, man, this chalk doesn't usually break. You guys should understand, this isn't just any chalk. This is Hagaroma chalk, the finest of all chalks. Once you've used this, you can't go back to that other garbage. Like this stuff that most schools give you, watch. Oh, see, this is a good board. You can't hardly tell the difference as much, but <clears throat> on a lesser chalkboard, like a lot of these boards we have are kind of slippery. Yeah, so you really can't see the difference on this board. Never mind. Trust me, the Hagarama, much better. A student introduced it to me last year. All right. The, uh, the, the, there's a very interesting story between the Hagarama, behind the Hagarama chalk. The um, place that was manufacturing it in Japan, um, the owner of it became convinced that chalk was not the future. Everyone was going to use either electronics or whiteboards, so he felt he shut down his company. But then mathematicians everywhere were very upset because this chalk is way, way better, like way better. Um, and so they started hoarding it. People bought up vast quantities of it and then sold it like, you know, out of the closet or something for a couple of years. But then I think a Korean company bought the machines for making this stuff and reopened the company. And so you can buy it again, but it's, it's pretty expensive. Although thankfully the department provides me some. Um, here, let's look at another one. Um, here's example um, three. Let's solve H equals to 2R plus 3M. We're going to solve for R. Uh, H equals to 2R plus 3M. Solve for R. Our instructions. So the big difference between this and what we did last time is just the answer here involves letters, right? The answer is an expression. Like last time, we only had one variable, right? And we solved the equation, and we got either a number, or we got zero equals zero, so everything was an answer, or we got no answers at all, right? But this time, these problems, the kind of answer is different, right? Like the answer is an expression, so. Um, what I'm going to do is this is going to give me 2R, excuse me, this is give me H um, minus 3M equals to 2R, right? So if I move 3M to the other side of the equation, I have to put a minus, right? And then what? Divide by 2, right? And there it is. Done, right? All right. Let me uh, share some something with you. So suppose volume of sphere is one hundred feet cubed. 
find radius. of this sphere. So there are word problems like this, right, that require what of us? They require some like, you know, previous knowledge. Do you guys know what the formula is for the volume of a sphere? Ah, so let me tell you. So in calculus, you can prove that the volume of a sphere is 4 thirds pi r cubed. Now here pi is what? Pi is that special number, 3.141, blah, 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 you know? Pi. So we need to find the radius of this, right? So, oof. This is a little bit different than the other ones, isn't it? 100 is 4 thirds pi r cubed, right? And so I, I isolate r cubed, right? So I'm going to do um, well, divide both sides by, uh, first of all, multiply both sides by 3, right? Agree? 3 times 100 is 300. And then I should do what? I should, I should divide by 4 pi, right? So 300 over 4 pi equals r cubed. Now, um, so yeah, oh, so actually the, the problem in your book, it says just to solve for r cubed. So um, I think the answer, the question that they're asking you is actually like find the radius cubed of this sphere. I forgot there's a cube there, my bad. So with that, we're done. Like that's, we've solved for the radius cubed. To find the radius, we need to know something else. There's something called a cube root. You guys ever heard of a cube root? The cube root, so like the cube root of r cubed, well, guess what it's equal to? It's equal to r, right? essentially by definition. So like if I wanted to solve for r, what I have to do with this equation is I have to take the cube root of both sides. Now technically speaking, that is not a problem which would appear in your section um, 1.2. Okay, so like I'm perhaps getting ahead of the story here by writing that. But there you go, r it would actually be the cube root of 300 over 4 pi. Right. And if you wanted to find a number, you'd have to use a calculator, right? I mean, I can't tell you cube roots off the top of my head. I mean, I can only do a few of them. You know, cube root of 8 is 2, because 2 times 2 times 2 is 8, for example. Cube root of 125 is 5, because 5 times 5 times 5 is 125. I know a few of them, but cube root of 300 over 4 pi? I need a calculator. But that's what R would be, if you're curious. Um, but like, in this section 1.2, problem four in your homework is to solve for r cubed. All right. So, all of the um, all of the uh, examples in your my math lab are from the book, pretty much. Right. They're 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 book problems that have been changed a little bit or something, or sometimes they're just literally the same. And um, one of the things, so you you don't have the physical copy of the book, right? But you have the electronic book. You know, in the back of the electronic book, there are answers to all the odd problems. So if you ever want to like look those examples up, you can. Of course, I think we also have the um, help me solve it thing in, in the My Math Lab. Is that right? Yeah. So sometimes that's more convenient for you guys, right? But OK. Do you guys need to see more of these, or do you, I think we should move on? Yeah. Let's, let's, let us move along here. So um, I fully expect that when you guys actually try to do the My Math Lab, you're going to get hung up on some of the word problems. When you do that, I want you to come in here and tell me which one you got stuck on, and we'll work through it together, OK? But I can't do that until you guys get stuck on them, right? So I'm just going gonna, gonna to go on so we have time for that later, all right? But that will never happen unless you guys actually come in here and ask me the question, all right? 
And you better take like a screenshot of it on your phone or something because the, the computer in here doesn't work. Otherwise, I won't be able to see the problem, you know. Um, or you can email it to me like, but you have to email it to me like the day before because otherwise I don't check email right before class, you know. All right, anyway. So, <clears throat> section 1.3. Incidentally, this stuff we're doing right now, th these kind of problems, are part of what hooked me on mathematics. Um, see, when I was a high schooler, so um, I loved arithmetic as a child. Like, I loved adding and subtracting, multiplying, all that stuff, like finding areas of triangles, rectangles, whatever. I loved all that stuff. But then when I got to algebra, I just, I didn't understand. Like, what are we doing? Like, what's the point of it? And no one was able to, like, I was a stubborn, stubborn, rebellious 13-year-old or whatever, so I didn't really, I didn't get it. And so I, I kind of got turned off to algebra for a couple of years. And I mean, I kind of stumbled through it. But um, I was going to actually um, mow yards for a, for a living. I had a 1984 Ford Ranger that, for some reason, people had taken a Pinto. Do you guys know what a Pinto is? There's like a subcompact car they sold in the 70s called a Pinto, Ford Pinto. And they take a Pinto engine somehow and put it in the Ford Ranger. So this was a very underpowered Ford Ranger, mind you. And I had a, um, a trailer kit I got from like Farm and Tractor and built, like wood and side stuff. And my, I had like a 44 inch, uh, you know, deck, uh, Lowe's tractor. And I just started mowing lawns. And like I was going to do that. Like that was going to be my thing, you know. And, but my dad was like, well, if you want to stay in the house and not pay rent, you need to go to school. I'm like, fine. So um, we ended up, say, the local community college had some different choices, and I ended up choosing. I wanted to do electrical, like just wiring, you know? But um, because I looked at it, and that only had one English requirement, just one. You know, electronics, in contrast, I, I noticed it had two English requirements. So I was like, Definitely want to do the course with just one English requirement. And, um, but I took some placement tests, and the, uh, the advisor for the electronics program basically said, no, you're not going to do electrical. You're going to do electronics because your math scores are good. And I'm like, but they have two English. He's like, you'll be fine. I was like, mm. So I started, I just did whatever he told me. He's like, here, take these 20 hours. He just signed me up for 20 hours of credit. We're on the quarter system at that point, you know? And um, so I started taking general physics um, from him. This is in Malin Community College, which is like, so it's Malin because it's three rural counties in North Carolina. I, I grew up in upstate New York. We moved to North Carolina when I was like 15 or something, early 90s. And um, anyway, so I started taking this general physics course. And it was there that I started dawning on me, oh, I need algebra if I have an equation in physics and I want to solve for one thing in terms of the other. Like, that's what algebra does for me. It, it, it's, it's, the skill, it's the skill I need to be able to understand how to solve physical problems. And it just, it just dawned on me, oh, this is useful. This is something I would actually like to know. And it kind of hooked me on math. I mean, that's, that's how I got started um, being interested, again, in math. I was always interested in arithmetic, but so. And then <clears throat> somehow I became a math professor. So <laughs> but originally, I was interested in math and physics. But uh, as time has gone on, I have realized I'm primarily interested in mathematics. But hmm. all right, so anyway, sorry to waste your time. Let's see here. So do 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 do. So I'm glad my dad made me go to school. It was good. <laughs> but I missed the community college. Like, it was nice. We'd have classes in the morning, and then I had night classes, too. And sometimes I'd just get stuck there because it was like a half hour from my house. So what we'd do in the middle of the day, we'd just play pool for like five hours. They had a quarter table in the cafeteria. It was great. So, all right. So, um, section 1.4, wait a minute, was I in section 1.3? Okay, cool. 
um, section 1.4 is stats, stats and equalities in interval notation. What was 1.3? Applications in problem solving. Oh, we, we kind of did that. So the applications in problem solving questions in their homework, you get stuck on them. You come in here, we'll work on them together, OK? So um, inequalities. So this is section, so what I was saying is for section 1.3, just try them. And, um, work on them together. If you guys would like, I can just go ahead and work a problem or two from the section 1.3. Would that be good? I mean, I can do that. It's your class. Just do one. All right, pick a number between 1 and 42. 7. I like it. 7 from section 1.3. <laughs> I thought that section seemed long. So here's the question. A premium drawing pencil set of 144 pieces was on sale. At, uh, online, of course, at 30% off for a 24-hour period, for a day. There we go. Uh -huh. um, Abby purchased the set while it was on sale. Well, it was on sale for $176.40. What was the original price? So this is not a real world problem because in the real world of here or Tuscaloosa, you get hosed for like 10% property tax, right? Ugh, so tired of it. Um, but this is, there's no property tax, right? This is just, imagine a perfect world where they didn't always take money from you every time you bought something. Um, so how do we think about this? So. We need to like invent a variable to express what we're trying to find, right? So let's call the original price x, right? x, right? What does this sentence mean? It was on sale, it was on sale online at 30% off. So what what's the cost actually equal? The sale cost, right? Sale price. in terms of x, it would be what times x? What's that, 100 what? 100, what's that? 144, no, no. 176, I mean, you're right, this is equal to 176.40, absolutely. 30%, but, but that would be, that would, but, so first of all, we wouldn't put 30%, we'd put 0.3, right? That would be the money saved though, right? So for example, if the, if, suppose X was 100, right? If you have 100 and it's 30% off, what's the price? It's 70, right? 30% off 170. So 
how do I, this 70 is, if you think about it, 0 0.7 times 100, right? So like what we need to put here, since it's 30% off, that means we still have 70% of the cost. So we have to put 0 0.7. I know it's kind of a little bit sneaky, but that, that's it. So, so that, that's what we're dealing with. 0 0.7 times x is 176.40. Does that make sense? Or no? So again, here's my example. If I have $100, and I take 30% off, I've got $70. How is $70 related to 100? It is. I get that part. Oh, mm -hmm. Where does the 0.7 come from when there's. Because it's. There's no 70. Or $100, yeah. Well, I'm saying, I mean, I'm just saying as, a, as an example of how, this, how the math works. If I had $100 and I took 30% off, I get 70, right? So like I can see from that that the way to model this is to do 0.7 times the actual cost. Um, I mean, I could just erase this and say, you got to put a 0.7 there, obviously, but that's not helpful. Um, so the way I think about it is if it's 30% off, that means it's still 70% of the actual original price, right? So to get 70% of the original price, I do 0.7 times the original price. And that's equal to 176.40. Now we got to solve for x. So what's x equal to? 176.40, right? Put my dollar divided by 0 0.7. What do you get? You get me regretting to not have my calculator is what you get. Let's see here. Where is my calculator? No, I mean, the, do, you, do you pay the 30% off? See, 30% reduction. If I put 0 0.3 here, that tells me how much money I saved. Um, no, you got you to gotta do like 100 minus 30 gives you 70%, and then... 70% is like multiplying by 0.7. Um, so this works out to, well, I got to go grab my, I keep forgetting to get my calculator on the way here. I'm sorry, guys. Ah! Dang it. Curses. I did it out of spite. Let's see here. So did you guys put it in your calculator? Because mine is apparently at home. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I got 252. So there you go. That's the price. If you have $252 and you take 30% off of it, you get 176.40. And that makes a lot of sense. What's 10% of 252? It's about $25, right? I mean, think about it. If it's 252 divided by 10, you got $25, basically, right? 2520? Multiply that by 3, you're subtracting 7560. You take 7560 off this, you got 17640. So it makes, that's, that's a good answer. Let me see if I can find another one. It seems like we should work more of these, right? Um, let's, let's look at the sales tax question, which is next, right? Number 8. So we'll, we'll do inequalities Friday. There's no hurry. We got time. So here we go. Um, Gareth purchased, Gareth, uh, Gareth purchased 
a watch um, for sixty-four dollars and fifteen cents. This included seven percent sales tax. Seven percent, that sounds amazing at this point. Seven percent, I missed seven percent sales tax. What was the price of the watch itself? In other words, what was the price of the watch before tax? So what, what equation should we write to capture this idea? So the equation that you want to write is this. So let's call the price of the actual price of the watch x, all right? And so what, we're get, what, what we got here is that 64.15, rather $64.15, is equal to 1.07 times x. So we, to get this, to calculate sales tax, we multiply, you know, 1.0 whatever the percentage is. If you had 10% sales tax, you'd multiply by 1.1. Right? If you had 5% sales tax, you'd multiply by 1.05. Wait, how many times are we going to get 7% until 1.03? Yeah, this 7% indicates that we multiply by 1.07. If you like, we could think about it this way. So we have, what's the price of the watch, right? It's the price of x plus 0 0.07 times x. So this is the tax, right? This is the, you know, price without tax. But what happens when you add those together? You get 1.07. Does that make more sense? Now, of course, we want to um, we want to solve for x, right? What do we got? So you divide by one point oh seven, right? What do we get? X equal to sixty four point fifteen. Divide by 107, and that gives us 59.95. The original price of the watch. So maybe I have an idea here, right? So another way to explain why we put 0.7 here is to look at it this way, right? The sale price, maybe this will help you understand better. Sale price, right, is equal to the, you know, X original price minus 0 0.3 times X. So this is the original price. This is the money saved. So when we combine those, we get 1 minus 0.3, which is 0.7. Does that make it make more sense to you? For me, the, for whatever reason, like the 0.7 is hardwired into my brain. Like I originally I just immediately intuitively know that's what I should put there. But I understand like you don't think that way. It, it, like that's not a native thought to you. It's fine, you know. Um, anyway, so um, let's see here. Let's work a geometric one. Here's a problem about um, a, a, court, a basketball court. The perimeter of an NBA-sized basketball court is 288 feet. So perimeter. 288 feet. So here's the basketball court, right? And we're told 
in number nine here, that the length is 44 feet longer than the width. Right? Okay, so then the question is, the question is this, find the dimensions of the court, right? Find the dimensions of the court. So to do this, right, we, we need to come up with like, uh, you know, do my sad basketball hoops. Anyway, so um, we need to give a label. It's either the length or the width. I think that we should call the width x, right? So the width, I'm going to call x. Then, so that would make x like here, right? And then the length would be what? This distance right here would be what? It would be 44 more, right? So it would be x plus 44. Agree? So if I, let me just draw it down here. So I've got x here, I've got x here, I've got x plus 44 here, right? I've got x plus 44 here. What's the perimeter of this rectangle? Yeah, the perimeter. So 288 is equal to the, to the what? The sum of the lengths of the sides, right? So what is that here? That's x plus x x plus, I mean, here it is, it's, start wherever you want, it's, it's x plus, x plus 44 plus x, plus x plus 44, right? Which, of course, we could simplify, right? That's, how many x's do I got? One, two, three, I got four x's, right? And I got two copies of 44, so I really got 4x plus 88, right? Can you solve for x? I think we can, right? So subtract, do what? Subtract 88 from both sides, what do we get? Yeah. 200 is equal to 4x, yeah? So looks like um, 200 divided by 4 is equal to x. So what did we, what do we, what's 200 over, 200 over 4 is 50, right? So we get x equals to 50. So of course that's the width, what's the length? We need to add 44 to that, right? So 50 plus 44 is 94, right? So And the answer then is what? So the dimensions of the court is 50 feet by 94 feet. So 50 by, right? Do you guys know the abbreviation for foot? Like you can do this, right? 50 feet by 94 feet, you guys got, and then inches is like prime prime, but anyway. So next time we'll start in section 1.4, unless you guys got questions about homework, which is always welcome in here, okay?